Welcome to How People Move People, a podcast about the impact that our words, art, stories, and lives have on each other. Each series journey unfolds in a sequence of six episodes. The first series titled Back and Forth is hosted by Kara Hagen, a New York City-based choreographer, professor, and mother who explores the influence of pop culture on the lives of Black girls from the 1990s to today. Guests range from poets and thought leaders to mom and daughter teams to an original fly girl from the Wayans Brothers hit 90s TV show, In Living Color. If I could speak my mind, what would I say? Being a strong Black woman doesn't mean I don't have pain. Doesn't mean I don't need help. Doesn't mean I don't need care. Doesn't mean I don't need protection. I need your care. I need your concern. I need your help because these bags are heavy. I need, I I need, I need love. I need hugs. I need kisses and uncomfortable public displays of affection. I need surprises and just because is, because, well, just because. I need to matter to you. If I could speak my mind, what would I say? I'm exhausted. I've been in defense mode since girlhood protecting myself from belts and switches and brooms and anything at arm's length. Protecting myself from predatory men, strangers and those known to me. Protecting myself from black familial trauma. Protecting myself from toxic family, toxic friends. Protecting myself from you. Protecting myself from me. Protecting myself from memories of being unprotected. Wounded, but still here. In fact, I am certain I have earned a purple heart from the wars of my childhood. The excerpt you just heard is from new work in progress called Speak My Mind by hip-hop choreographer-dancer Michelle Bird McPhee, which I had the pleasure of seeing on stage at Lincoln Center in the fall of 2022 as part of the Works and Process series, an initiative of the Guggenheim that supports artists in creating new work and sharing iterations of that work throughout the process of creation. McPhee is a self-described street dance activist and founder and artistic director of the New York-based Ladies of Hip Hop, an organization that centers women's voices and histories in hip hop culture. A Philadelphia native, McPhee was recently honored by having her image included in a new mural unveiled in the city in December of 2022, celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop by artist Christian Tamarts Rodriguez. You can find a photo of that mural and a photo from a recent performance of Speak My Mind on the podcast website. Welcome, friends to Back and Forth, a podcast exploring pop culture and the kinetic lives of Black girls. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Michelle Bird McPhee to talk about her career, her inspirations, and speaking to her childhood self. It's such a beautiful conversation. I don't want to say much more other than get comfortable and take a listen. I hope you are as inspired as I am by Michelle's words. I'm so excited. So I want to jump right in with the street dance activism. What is a street dance activist and how did you become one? Oh, wow. Um, Great question. I think, um, to be honest, I think that's still evolving in terms of like what the definition is. And, And if I think about it, really, it just to me means doing whatever needs to be done to center uh, hip hop culture, in particular women in hip hop culture, and do the work of um, being treated fairly, being paid fairly, um, being taken care of and not taken advantage of. Um, and so whatever that work requires or calls me to do um, is, is, is part of what I think a street dance activist is. Mm. 
And so coming from an art form that has historically been male dominated, how did hip hop find you? Hmm. Good question. Uh, Because everyone usually answers or asks the reverse, which is like, when did you find hip hop? Right. Um, So I think I don't have a clear kind of separation of like, oh, now I love hip hop because you know, I grew up in a household that was that played all different types of music. And and uh, my mom was a record collector. My uncle was a, a radio DJ. And so when I say we had tons of music albums, actual physical vinyl around, um, this was just another album that was put on the turntable for us to, to dance to. And so I don't know that I have a clear like, Oh, I I love hip hop. It was just more music. It was more black music at the time, you know. Um, it you know it was a Sugar Hill Gang, you know, which was for me an extension of what I was hearing. You know, you could think about songs that were R and B songs that you heard people, you know, rhyming in patterns, you know. So you know, for me, it was just a, an extension of black music. But if I think about when I decided, like, hey, I kind of want to pursue this. Uh, as a career, even though that probably wasn't the conscious words. It was just, you know, um, how can I figure out a way to have this part of my life at all times? It was probably in my late 20s, you know, so, you know, I'm not going to say how old, but it it was quite a while ago. And, um, and I knew even as I've tried to like work, um, not tried, but as I've been in other fields, it's never left me in terms of um, whether I'm presenting work or, or 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 producing an event, it's always been part of my life since the music came along, you know, um, the movement and the culture all came with it. So, you know, I think since its inception, it's been part of my life. Mm, beautiful. And so thinking about you as baby Michelle, um, when you were growing up, who were some of the most influential artists in your life and what did they teach you about being in the world? Awesome. Um, I, well, I always start with my mother. She was such a huge influence for me. And um, even though she didn't pursue dance as a career, my mom was a designer and, and, and she also was a hairdresser. So from very young, she made all of our clothes, but also had her own line uh, of clothing with her own group of models that she did both their hair and their clothes. And so for me, and then she opened physical spaces at when I was really, really young. So I think her first salon she had when I was 12. So for me, this idea of women being entrepreneurs were just, it, it just was normal for me as opposed mm-hmm. to like, you know, it being a thing now, you know? Um, so for me, the very, very first artist um, to have a huge impact on me and still does is my mom. And then uh, I would say, you know, my uncles as well, you know, my mom and my uncles always dance together. So for me, dance started as a family, but um, musically, I think, you know, again, we had so many influences, but I think when I started to kind of find my own music, um, Prince was a huge artist for me. I know most dancers hit Michael Jackson, but to me, the music that Prince was creating was so different and so funky and that he could dance and sing and play instruments. Um, I think the, even though it, it could be taken two, two, two ways, but you know, even though a lot of the women that were around him were hypersexualized, but they also had a level of like, this is my sexuality as opposed to him presenting them as a, as arm candy, even though they mm-hmm. kind of were at, mm-hmm. th- at times, but they all were, you know, producing their own, uh, um, artistic products as well, you know. So yeah. um, Prince for me was a huge influence. Um, Patti LaBelle, um, uh, Teddy Pendergrass, all of Philly Sound because I'm originally from Philadelphia. So any music that came out of there was a huge influence on just like the soulfulness and and uh, the fullness of, of of music and dance for me. Yeah, and so coming from Philly to New York. What were some of the cultural differences that you picked up on as a mover in terms of your practice in hip hop? I mean, obviously, every dance form has regional differences and quirks about it. So how would you compare the two and how were you comparing the two as a young person? 
Uh, as a young person, I think the comparison is more like um, just names, the way things were named were different, but, you know, and those things were regional. And there definitely were some dances that existed in Philly that may not have made it to New York yet or weren't part of that vernacular. But but also it was the commonality, you know, and the the immediate connection of no matter where you're from, um, you know the song and the dance, right? So you know once that song drops what you're supposed to do. And so um, I think even though, you know, not being born in New York City or, or raised in New York City, you have this like ideal of it being so huge and being so different. And in many ways it is, but but in terms of that subculture of music and dance, especially hip hop, it's more interconnected than it is divided. And so mm-hmm. um, it was more seeing the commonalities and how we could, you know, connect with each other um, without me knowing, you know, the street vernacular maybe of New York City um, a little different than Philly. But, you know, all the same, you know, in terms of uh, who, who we are as people and how we exist in that space in music. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for uh, saying that. And so I want to talk a bit about Ladies of Hip Hop. This is a big thing in your life. It, Ladies of Hip Hop Festival has been around for 16 years. So tell me a little bit about the inception of that project, its trajectory and where it's going. Yeah. And so Kara, at this point, just because you probably, I haven't updated my bio on the, on the, on the website. So we just finished our 18th year. So we oh, had two. Goodness. Yeah. So we're rounding up, um, out our, you know, we're, we're working our way up, I should say, to our 20th year, which is really exciting. Um, yeah. I never foreseen it to, to, to stay around this long um, or even provide this much opportunity. But um, it's a, it is my life, you know, um, as much as I've tr- worked other jobs and tried to get away from it, it's, it's all, it's been part of my life for the last 20 years and really been what's kept me grounded and happy in any space that I'm working in. Um, but especially now because uh, post-pandemic, um, actually right prior to the pandemic, I had decided that, you know, I wasn't going to work for any other organization. I was going to really put all of my time and effort into Lays of Hip Hop and, you know, see what could come out of if I took all of my kind of resources that I've, you know, gathered from working in different spaces and applied that to, to Lays of Hip Hop full time. And so, um, being able to work on this uh, full time has allowed us to create more programming. So the week long festival is what it is. It's it's just getting better and better every year. Um, you know, we are able to have so many am- amazing women who come and, you know, chat on our panels, our discussions, who are part of our workshops, who present their own work as part of our showcase and then who kind of round out our week by participating in the battle, whether it's just you know, they're celebrating other women battling, whether they're judging, all female DJ panels. So it's just like one of the the most energized and kind of fun spaces to be in for a week. But we also now have, you know, a performance company. And so we're sharing, you know, more on a regular basis, uh, this work that we're creating and what we're doing. So coming up with that matter of fact, we have Pillow this month. So we're going to Jacob's Pillow. Um, returning actually. And then we're performing at the shed here in New York city. Mm -hmm. And we have some other um, kind of residencies happening that I can't, you know, announce yet, but, you know, continuing to do this work. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I'm focused on a project called black dancing bodies, which is focusing on women, uh, black women in hip hop. And the reason why it's necessary is because I personally kind of felt like we were disappearing and I also felt we weren't connected. Right. And so that um, I feel like we are kind of the model for a lot of things that get copied or used or taken and then given back to us in a way as if we weren't the creators and innovators of it. And so I felt it necessary for us to connect on a bigger level. And it it originally just started out as a um, photography project just for us to be seen. And now we've proceeded to, we had a, a, a world premiere of a work um, at the Guggenheim in March of this year. And we've workshopped it in some pillow labs and we'll be going back to pillow this summer to represent some of that work. And so um, I think, I don't know what's on the horizon. I just want to make it to 20 years. Um, I am just 
every year just so grateful to be able to continue it. Um, and we're just going to keep doing some amazing stuff. I opened up a studio that is it's a pop up studio that I partnered with Snipes with. Um, and I'm just trying to do all the most amazing partnerships that I can do. So bringing the breaking community together, bringing the whacking community together and and presenting events with them. We're going to have our first residency in January. So we'll have resident artists just thinking outside of the box of how to exist as an organization and as artists and, and more of a collaborative effort beyond just serving um, our mission and our vision, because in order for street dance to survive, we have to kind of band together and continue to present everyone's work and, and give space for everyone. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And having been to the festival, I mean, I know that kind of energy that you're talking about. It's infectious. Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, have, having the festival uh, been around for 18 years, I imagine even though you started it as an adult, you've grown up a lot in this process. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. I mean, I don't think I knew at all what I was doing when I started. So, um, you know, I grew up, yes, um, you know, getting older, doing it, but, but I've learned so much over the years and, and, um, learned how to, I found my voice within it, you know, um, even though, I was empowering women for many years. I don't think I was even empowered as, you know, as I should have been, you know, always making um, kind of talking about the work in a different way or um, making apologies for being hip hop or for being a woman or for being black, you know. So, yes, in those ways, I have really grown and developed as um, an executive director. I really kind of understand what that means and, and being able to convey our mission and vision and why what we do is important to folks. Um, but then just getting better logistically and like running it now, it kind of runs itself, you know? Um, now with that said, it's a lot of work, but you know, we have developed a system and, and everything is documented. And, and so this way of, you know, it just getting better and better every year has just been, um, you know, being around for 20 years or almost 20 years has, has allowed space for that. And so um, I feel like I'm learning every year. You know, we took on two new partners this year. And so with time, those things are, you know, things that you can do. And so we've partnered with um, Chelsea Factory and uh, our big partner for the week was Give Me Dance and having, you know, just learning how to partner with other people is a big deal, right? Because I've been doing this by myself for, for 17 years. So this year, the 18th year, we had these partners who also have been around 30, 40 years, you know, way longer than us and have um, an understanding of how to do things, but not necessarily an understanding of our culture, right? And so, you know, knowing how to have that voice to make sure, again, that we are always taken care of and respected and, mm -hmm. and say, hey, that might be how you do it. And it works for your, um, you know, your demographic. But if you really want to, if you really want our people to be here, both as artists and audience, these are the things that you are going to have to do, you know? And so, um, that comes with time. I definitely did not know how to do that and, and how to have that voice um, when I, when it first started. So, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. And so speaking of development, you have this arm of the ladies of hip hop, hip -hop called Girls of Hip Hop, mm -hmm. and that's for Black and Latino girls age, ages 7 to 17. Talk to me a little bit about that and what the importance of that program is. Um, yeah, again, it was, it really came out of just, you know, I throw events and I have classes and we all teach and just noticing that within those spaces, brown and uh, black and brown girls weren't always present. Uh, if they were, it was one or two. And so just making sure we are doing the work of, uh, not just existing for the sake of existing and being a great event and being a great organization, but make sure we're doing the work to reach out to the youth of the community and provide opportunity. And it's not necessarily always these are communities that are under-resourced. It's just that, you know, we as Black and Brown people have often given away the things that we've created, but also they have been stolen, right? And so generationally, you know, there are kids that ha didn't grow up with, with hip hop music in the sense that 
you know, they understand the history of it or the culture of it or the dance of it. It's more, uh, you know, especially with social media. So we're battling, you know, our kids yeah. learning uh, the music only in a commercial sense and only in this sense that, you know, of this social media entertainment. And so mm -hmm. we wanted to provide a space that not only to bring those young girls in, but also provide a space for black and brown women to teach, right? And because we are often not the first people in that in that space as well, educators. And so, you know, even with, I had uh, Jackie, uh, Miss Funk from uh, Versus Styles teaching Tweety, um, even the younger dancers who you know are representing different communities. I have dancers who are both Black and Japanese, and so you know having that representation as teachers, as educators, people passing on the dance is super important. So, so it, I feel like the mission of that project is twofold, but it's you know it, it's re very important. And basically, what happens is we. Um, during actually during the fall summer it's kind of hard because kids have so many other things to do but during the fall we offer online classes and that was also because we didn't have a space so this fall we will have actual physical classes where the girls can come once a month and train with three different teachers mm, congratulations that's awesome mm -hmm. thank you and so thinking about hip-hop culture more broadly what does hip-hop ultimately teach young girls about moving hmm. through the world, in your opinion? Great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that question. <laughs> I think uh, if I think about the culture as a whole, it could, it can teach community, right? Um, and it could teach that we have a space, I have a belonging, that we are innovators, that we are amazing at what we do um, if if we if they're able to find those spaces so I do feel like you know we have a job as people on the inside of this and artists to really make sure that we are finding these young women and and you know doing the work of tapping into really giving them the real thing and not like surface you know because if I, I listen, I don't knock any music. I feel like artistically, I can see why a Cardi B would be interesting as well as a no name, right? You know, there, every spectrum of how we exist as women in hip hop culture and in particular the music, because that's the most visible and that's often the first thing that, um, what young women are seeing. Uh, I can see, I, I don't think the answer is to like, erase any part of that, you know, I think it's to show, show the fullness of, of who we are as women, but also show the fullness, you know, because we, we often only see the Cardi B. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that's our job is, you know, to make sure that we are giving a full spectrum of how we exist in this space and how we can be empowered as organizers, as educators, as uh, speakers, lecturers, you know, very often we shy away from that space in particular um, to just tell our story. You don't have to know everything about every portion of hip hop, but you do have to know how to communicate your story and your love of it. And so I hope on some level that is what we are doing with with girls and women in Ladies of Hip Hop. Mm, beautiful. And my final question for you is what does Ladies of Hip Hop give back to baby Michelle? Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Wow. Great question. <laughs> what does it give back to baby Michelle? Uh, it really does give a sense of there's a place for me because I didn't go to college until I was 24 because I felt like I knew what I wanted to do. And it was involving street and club dance culture. Um, and I couldn't find that in a higher education space. And I never did when I went. Um, but with what I did personally and what I did, you know, in terms of higher education, I was able to find the, my, not find, but make my own path. And so it's giving me a level of like, there's a space for baby Michelle. Um, you will get to be on the Ailey stage, not as an Ailey dancer, but as you're, you know, doing your own stuff. Uh, cause I was like obsessed with Ailey when I was younger and, and still am. I mean, it's amazing organization, amazing dancers. And, um, and, and, you know, brown girls are smart. Brown girls are dope. You know, like I was young during a time that, you know, it wasn't, 
there wasn't so much black girl magic and all of this empowerment. It wasn't really like cute to be a brown girl, you know? And so um, to, to, if I can impart anything to her is to do continue to love and do the things that you want to do, because it will, you will go far beyond what you ever dreamed. Mm, So gorgeous. Thank you so much. Michelle Bird McPhee. Thank you for all your wisdom. You are dope. I'm such a fan. And thank you for gracing us with your presence today, for giving us your time. Thank you for having me, Karis. Always, always dope. Thanks again for joining me on the Back and Forth podcast. And I hope you'll join me next time when I sit down to chat with Deidre Lang, an original fly girl. If you grew up in the 90s, you know what I mean. I'll see you there. How People Move People is brought to you by the National Center for Choreography at the University of Akron, or NCC Akron. This podcast is produced by Jennifer Edwards. James Sleeman is our editor. Theme music by Ellis Roven. Transcription by Arushi Singh. Cover art by Micah Kraus. I am Dakri Baptiste, Vice President and COO at the Orpheum Theater Group in Memphis, Tennessee and a proud NCC Akron board member. Special thanks to the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation for their continued support of NCC Akron programming like this. To learn more about NCC Akron, please visit us at nccakron.org and follow us on Instagram or Facebook at NCC Akron. We hope you enjoyed this episode and encourage you to subscribe on your favorite podcast streaming platform by searching for How People Move People.